Check, check. You hear me? All good? All right. So let's take a minute or two more. Four hours of battery should be enough. Ето е някакви хора идват. Къде е Тони? Добре. Проверяйте за VIP. All right. Are we online? Everything's good? Great. So, hello everyone. It is extremely nice to see so many people in the first Django Meetup for 2020. First of all, huge shout out to Tony and Teddy. Tony and Teddy will be somewhere here for organizing, for organizing uh, the meetup and a uh, huge shout out, of course, to Wounchi for providing this extremely cozy place so we can be here. Uh, my name is Ivaro Bachvarov. Most of you know me. I'm a CDO at a company called Hacksoft. You have probably heard of it. First of all, I'm really sorry for skipping the last couple of meetups, but I got a pretty serious reason for that. Actually, two reasons, but yeah, you know. So I decided to make Hello, everyone. I decided to make a quick talk about Unicorn, what it is, how it works, and basically what we don't know and what we should know about it, because most of the developers, they don't really deal with it. Unicorn is basically the server, the nice piece of software that is between your web server, probably some kind of load balancer, NGINX, router or whatever, and your Django application. And most developers, they don't really deal with it because while you're devel developing locally, um, you're kind of using your Python managed PY run server. So Unicorn is the part of the world where only the DevOps or only the people that have access to the server are dealing with. And that's why it's kind of interesting topic. And that's why I decided to make some deeper knowledge there, try some things and see how they behave. So what is Unicorn? Unicorn is actually using the Unix pre-fork pre web server. So it's basically a process that forks itself into many other processes. We have a master process that is doing nothing but just keeping the other processes alive. And when the other, some of the other processes die, it's just forking itself in order to maintain a good number of workers. So basically, it's using the Unix pre-fork in order to maintain the workers and the workers are actually doing the web job. It's actually doing, calling your Django, the Django is doing the job, and then they're getting back all the information to the uh, load balancer or NGINX or whatever you, you have out there. Most of the Django projects nowadays use Unicorn as, uh, as a server on production. So here what happens when you um, kind of start your 
uh, unicorn server. This is basically what you see in your console. I, on your console, I created a repo with a sample project. I'm going to share you the link after the talk so you can take a look. But when you start your unicorn server, you are um, pointing your WSGI file and it starts two project, two process by default. The first one is the master process. This is the uh, ID of the process, the master process. And then on the bottom you can see all the workers. This is the only one worker that we have by default uh, for our uh, unicorn server. So by default it only starts one process or it is um, referring an N of a variable called uh, web concurrency. And if there is no such N of a variable, on most servers there are no such N of a variable out of the box, it's basically working with only one worker. And I've seen many, many people running their Django applications having some scalability uh, problems, mainly because they have only one worker and, nothing, and nobody has configured the um, unicorn to, to work with more workers and Nobody has tried to squeeze the maximum performance out of the unicorn server. So this is really, really common scenario to run your unicorn with only one worker. So I decided to, I actually read a, a lot about unicorn and how uh, you can configure it, but in order to prove my knowledge, I decided to uh, run a couple stress tests, a couple uh, tests basically to prove that my knowledge is actually correct. And like most things in the programming, you need to test it yourself in order to be sure that it works. So in this presentation, I'm going to uh, show you my, my, my test, my results. I created a um, simple view, basically serializing uh, objects, selecting objects from database with one relation and uh, using Django Serializer to uh, uh, show this data. It's simple model uh, serializer. So should be pretty, pretty straightforward API, right? Most of you are already familiar with this kind of code. And on the other side, I used a um, tool called Hey. It is an uh, open source stress tool for stressing your web pages, APIs, basically to see how the unicorn performs with different types of load and different types of traffic. Um, another disclaimer is that um, I used real hardware I tried this test on a lot of shared hostings like uh, Heroku, DigitalOcean, but I got really mixed results, mainly because the uh, computer power that they provide is shared between many users, and you get different results every time testing. So your API may, may, may result in less than a second sometime. Uh, many times it can result in two seconds, three seconds, depend on the actual server load for the other users. So in order to have noise-free results, I decided to test on real hardware laying around in our office or just found, found a server. Uh, it's a quad core server with uh, four gigabytes of RAM. So I just decided to run the uh, unicorn server there and stress test it from my laptop. So here is uh, what we basically have. At the bottom, you can see what, what, what I run on the server. So basically a unicorn with only one worker and of course the master process that is keeping the only one worker alive. And on the other hand, you can see uh, two parameters that I'm passing to my um, console application hey here. So the first one is the total amount of HTTP calls that, are, that we are going to make, it's only one, and the concurrency is only one. So here the uh, tool is just making one call and we can see that this call takes like 0 0.039 seconds to execute. It's really fast API. Um, it is just returning around 200 objects with one relation, so it's not really big objects, it's kind of a fast API. Most of you are already familiar with this kind of APIs, they are, they are pretty straightforward. So, <clears throat> as you see, the slowest request is, again, the only request, the fastest request is, again, the fastest request, the, the, the only request, and on average, we have one result. This is because we sent only one call. But what happens when we decide to uh, send like 100 calls? And the concurrency here is, set to one. That means that this tool is making one call, waiting it for it to finish, then send the other call, then send the other call, then send the other call, and we are doing this a hundred times. So what should be the result based on the previous result? What do you think? Yeah, totally makes sense. So if we have 0 0.039 for a hundred requests, we have 3.6, which is around a hundred times slower. 
which is kind of normal, you know, totally makes sense. If only one worker, you send 100 concurrent requests and the worker needs to process them one by one by one by one by one. So the first option that, oh, and what happens when we send uh, 100 concurrent requests? So these are basically the same amount of requests, but they're not waiting each other, they're sent concurrently. Absolutely. So, what should be the result, what do you think? Should be the same, should be pretty much the same, yeah. So, yeah, almost the same, even, probably even a little bit slower. Uh, these are results taken from, on average, from many different runs, just to be sure that we're not having some sort of, I don't know, the uh, Postgres database decides to uh, vacuum itself at the same time and we're getting worse results. So it's an average of many codes. Good, so the first thing that we can do here is just pound more workers. This is the uh, most native decision that any developer would take. And if we take 500 calls, it's going to get even slower with only one worker. It's going to take up to 16 seconds, which is starting to create a problem. No one wants to, to, to wait 16 seconds to get a result. So what we need to do is to introduce more, more workers. So, so the next example here is with four workers, right? You can see the result of the common. This is the, the common. This is the ID of the uh, four workers that we have. And for 500 results, what should be the uh, for, for 500 requests? What should be the uh, expected result? What do you think? So, so for for one core, it is 16 seconds. For four cores, it's going to be around four. Yeah, around 3.6 even. I don't know why. Just different kind of results, but uh, yeah, it's like four times faster, which totally makes sense. You know, we have four times more workers. And that's pretty straightforward, but 3.6 seconds is not such a great result, right? I mean, we are still processing 136 requests per second, which is kind of a lot, but we can do better if we have a load of 500 concurrent requests and someone needs to wait 3.6 seconds. It's kind of pretty, pretty long waiting, right? So what can we do better? More workers, yeah, yeah, more workers. Let's try with eight workers. What do you think should be the expected result here? All right, all right, that's smart. So I would say if four workers is four times better, then eight workers would be eight times better. But it seems like it's starting to depend on your actual hardware that you have. And for the hardware currently uh, running, uh, in the office that I was testing on, we have only four physical cores. That's going to be the same, yeah. So, so what we are doing here, oh, it, it depends if it's going to be the same, but what we are doing here is, yeah, the result is the same. Even the result should be a little worse because the CPU is constantly switching between different processes and this takes more time. So the result is not going to be better because we are already hitting the machine limit. We have four cores on a dedicated CPU. No one else is using the CPU for, for anything. So our results are kind of constant. And now we have to take a look at our, uh, basically, our application. What, what, what is it doing? So I decided to install the uh, Django Debug 2. And this is some pretty interesting insight what we are doing. So we have our request completed in 213 seconds, milliseconds, sorry. And our CPU time was around 200. So almost all of the lifespan of the request was a CPU usage. You know? There was no, almost no waiting for anything. We have some queries, only one query to the, to the database in less than two, two milliseconds, which is really, really fast query. In real life, you don't get such fast queries. Uh, but again, in this simple example, we have uh, like 95% CPU time. Why it's so slow? Because of the serialization, of the deserialization of the objects. It has <clears throat> it its own reasons, but it is kind of, this workload is almost 95% CPU usage. So we can't do anything better with this hardware. The only thing we can do is to buy more, more machines, buy more hardware, buy more cores, buy faster cores, or I don't know. So this is actually the maximum we can squeeze, or we should, kind of optimize our code of not using the uh, Django ORM objects, for example, use something faster, or not using the um, model serializer, use something faster. 
uh, in order to achieve better performance with this kind of hardware that we have. But, but if we have different type of views, maybe we have a view that is uh, doing some uh, database queries that are kind of slow, they're not optimized, or we have a views that are calling other APIs in order to get results, work with these results, and return it back to the user. This is not you know, a recommended scenario, but it always happened in the real life. And here I created a view that is basically sleeping for two seconds, nothing more. We can replace the sleep code with uh, sending a request to a third party, sending an email over HTTP. This is normally a slow, slow operation. Nobody do, does this in, uh, on HTTP requests. No, nobody writes this code in the view. We should use salary for, salary for this, but still it's really common example. Well, well, the most common example is to have pretty slow database responses. So if we have this view that is just sleeping for two seconds and just returning an empty, re an empty index HTML, we have a different view. We have 2,000 milliseconds and only 120 milliseconds of CPU time. So, so this view is uh, really not that CPU heavy. It's just the, 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 the CPU is just waiting for, for the job to finish and uh, returning a response. So let's see what we can do with this view. If we send 200 requests with four workers and each of these requests looks exactly or relatively two seconds to, to complete, well, if we are good at math, we can pretty quick answer that is going to take 100 seconds, yeah. So again, not, not great. Uh, we, we should be able to perform better, right? I mean, we have a pretty, pretty decent hardware with four cores. So the thing we can do is try to add more workers, the previous solution. And here, we have a good result. We have, all right, our workload is not so CPU intensive, so we can actually try to spawn more cores. That's why the unicorn guys are proposing to have uh, two times the workers uh, than the cores we have. So if you're having four cores, they, they recommend us having eight uh, workers. And this can pretty much uh, vary on the um, type of load that we have. If we have a lot of CPU operations, it's not going to work well for us. If we have a load of uh, IO operation, it's definitely going to do the trick. So I guess if we spawn more workers, because 10 seconds is still a lot of time to wait, right? Uh, if, if we spawn more workers, we are going to have uh, better response times and better, uh, better answers. But the problem with the workers is they eat a lot of RAM memory. They are just a fork of the Django process. And Django process is pretty heavy. It contains all the models, all the uh, code that you write, all the uh, URLs, everything. And you may have noticed that when you start your unicorn workers, they take a lot, a lot of RAM uh, memory. And uh, we, can, we can't really do a lot about it because this is basically how the Unix forking works. And the... Uh, Workers themselves, they don't share any memory. They are just independent process. They don't share any, any memory. Even though the memory of this process is kind of the same, they all have the, all your code, they all have your models, they all have your views, the URLs, all the uh, different stuff that you make, they're, they're all there, like duplicated eight times. So this is why in this picture you can see that we are using up to three gigabytes of RAM uh, for this, uh, how many workers? for these 14 workers. Yeah, it's a lot of workers, but it's a lot of RAM. So, the thing we can do here is introduce threads, uh, which are the Python native threads, uh, and they uh, allow each worker to uh, have multiple threads, and the threads, they do share memory. So if you run a configuration like this, like run four workers, but with 10 threads each, that is going to um, improve our concurrency with up, up to 40, request, 40 parallel requests, which is kind of better, and the RAM usage is going to be really, really low than running for individual work, uh, for the individual workers. So again, we have four workers, but each of these workers is capable of processing 10, up to 10 parallel requests. So if you try to run our test, again, with 20 results. We have, for only four workers, we have kind of better results. You know, we consume far less memory, and our productivity is like 10 times better than only four workers. So this is the case with many, many of the uh, shared hosting providers like Heroku. They provide 
really good CPU, but not enough memory, especially for Django applications that are really hungry for memory. And it's not really flexible, so, so you need to fine tune your Unicorn workers in order to, to get the maximum out of the uh, service. And the memory nowadays is not so uh, cheap on the uh, hosting providers, so it's always a good idea to know this and uh, be able to kind of fine tune your configuration. What else can we do? Uh, sorry? Yeah, you can always try to change your application in order to work faster. I mean, you can, you, you, you can create cache, you can uh, use different kinds of services like Redis, you can even cache the whole response, but this always creates more problem. You need to think how you're going to invalidate the cache, you need to think, uh, how to implement the cache, what are you using for your cache servers, are we going to introduce Redis, more infrastructure, more, more money, more, more hardware, more things to take care of. And why not trying to uh, improve your config production configuration uh, without actually changing the code itself. So uh, this is uh, using the uh, sorry, yeah. Using event, we are actually using the async IO uh, capabilities of Python. So you can, you again say how many workers, but with this configuration, with minus, minus uh, K given, you're kind of uh, saying, okay, this work, these four workers are going to use async IO to handle requests. And there is no limit of, practically no limit of, uh, how many requests these four workers are going to handle at the same time. So you can see for 200 requests, we are doing them in a little bit more than 2.3 seconds. Again, this, sorry? Yeah, the two seconds are the wait time and the 0.3 seconds are maybe some kind of uh, networking lag. Although I tested this in a gigabit connection in the office, so it's kind of, it must be fast enough, but yeah, it, it spent some time like trying to process this simultaneously and 200 parallel requests are a lot of requests. Normally, you don't hit on an average system such a heavy load. And two seconds of total response time is kind of, kind of fine. But you have the problem here. You don't have a limit of um, working on parallel requests. So if I send, let's say, a thousand parallel requests, uh, uh, ten of thousand parallel requests, it is going to really fast eat all of my memory. Uh, open a thousand connections to my uh, database, most probably going to kill my database, and I'm pretty vulnerable to uh, basically having a pretty easy DDoS by uh, DDoS of everything, database, workers, everything, uh, by uh, leaving this configuration like this. So, uh, they have introduced the worker count uh, parameter, and you can say that we have four workers, but each of these four workers is going to process up to 10 requests per second. And again, we see way faster results, not faster than without limit, you know, without a limit is like 10 times faster, but way faster than only having four cores, uh, only having four workers. So with the hardware that we have, we kind of reach the uh, limit of CPU intensive operations and uh, IO intensive operation. Uh, you just need to check what type of load you have. Normally, the load is kind of mixed. Normally, you have slow, slow queries. Normally, you have, uh, for example, a lot of queries per view if you don't optimize your calls. Normally, you are making calls to some ready servers. Normally, you are making calls to some RabbitMQ servers that are just I.O. operations. And sometimes, these calls are really, really slow, especially, for example, if you're calling third-party APIs. These third-party APIs may respond in 10 seconds, I don't know, and you don't want to keep your worker busy for 10 seconds, because if you use only workers, you know, it's just waste CPU time. So as a takeaway, uh, we can say that if you have a CPU heavy operations, just use workers that equals the count of your CPUs in your machine. If you have mixed uh, workload, like almost all of us have, uh, you, you can always spawn more workers. And if you're low on memory, like, most of the cases, because Django is pretty hungry on memory, uh, you can just uh, spawn some threads and workers and make them work together. And if you're using some I.O. heavy operations, then you better go on with the uh, async I.O. and 
the events in that. So this is the uh, my 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 takeaway. I managed to optimize a lot of our um, applications running in the cloud, and uh, I hope it was helpful. Thank you. We have a special mic for questions. So anyone with questions? No. No one? Rado? You want to grab the mic? I don't know. We, are, we, we do have a stream on YouTube, so maybe it's better with a mic so the audience on YouTube can hear you. If you? Mix, so, so, the down, so, so you don't really have a downside. It, yeah, so, so what is the downside of uh, running workers and threads? The uh, upside is using less memory, and the downside is kind of, of the performance. So the threads are kind of slower than having more workers if you are using uh, um, IO operations. And this is kind of what the um, results that I managed to show show. If you're heavily caching, you probably don't have a lot of problems with the um, performance because uh, you don't have any, if, if, you, if your cache is slow, there, yes, you, you can go with uh, uh, the events with the IO heavy uh, solution. Uh, but most of the cases, the cache is pretty fast because it's indexed and it just returns the answer with less than two milliseconds, for example. So again, most of the work is going to be CPU. It's going to be get what we have from the cache, try to process it, serialize it, and put it back to the uh, response. Any other questions? Martu? Get the mic. Problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, if your uh, app is like uh, going with the new Python, going uh, sync uh, forever, uh, you don't, uh, you don't like, uh, you can't really use unicorn. Unicorn. Yeah. Unicorn. Yeah. You use something like Daphne or something like this. Yep. Uh, there is a new Daphne alternative that is getting kind of popular. Uh -huh. But yes, if you're using the uh, Unicorn only works with WSGI uh, yeah. implementation, and this is this is actually Django three project that I'm uh, running. Yeah. So there is an ASGI file, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yes, you, you you can't run this with Unicorn. Okay, uh, so do you know what problems would I hit if I go with Daphne and the Django three approach of? The well, um, I managed to uh, play a bit with this. Yeah. Um, did not manage to include it in the presentation, but uh, not a whole lot. I mean, you're, you're still having the same flexibilities, uh, just the implementation is kind of different. Uh, you can benefit uh, a little from the HTTP2 stuff if your application is capable of benefiting from that. And uh, again, you have the ability to set a limit because with the async stuff, you can pretty easily damage yourself. Uh, you have some note experience, so you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so yes, it's pretty much uh, the same, but a little bit better. Okay. It works a little bit faster. So I got the same problems, but uh, a little bit op optimized. Yes. OK. That was my question. Hello. Uh, how would you uh, manage three or, three or four Django apps on one server? How would you uh, configure them with Unicorn? Uh, I would run separate Unicorn instances for, for all the different projects. Um, I would heavily try not to run them on the same machine without some kind of dockerization or putting them in isolation. Uh, and I would have some heavy load balancer in front of them just to manage the request. You go to this Django app and you go to, to this Django app. And you're talking about different Django apps, right? You're not talking about one, the same project. Yeah, I would do that. So, so I don't think it's even an easy way to, to run multiple Django projects with one unicorn instance. Okay, thank you.
Is that working? Yeah. Uh, before we continue, uh, I would like to invite Martin to say a few words uh, for the course we are organizing. Um, he's going to tell you. <laughs> yeah. um, so I got some notes because I think is it working? Okay. Uh, hey everyone, I am Marto. Most of you don't know me, um, but it's okay. <laughs> so we are organizing our um, best course so far, Python 101. Um, it's really good for people who want to learn how to program, how to become the best junior <laughs> in Sofia so far. Um, it's starting uh, in the end of February on the 24th, 24th, yeah. Um, I'm gonna lead the course, so if you have any questions, you can reach me on Rich, Teddy, or Tony. Uh, if your company wants to support the course, you can again reach only Tony and Teddy, not me. <laughs> um, what else? Um, yeah, the application for the course is starting uh, in the beginning of the next week, but you had better uh, follow Hackball Guide on, on Facebook. Yeah, on Facebook, we're gonna post there. And that's pretty much everything. Yeah, uh, if you have any questions, please reach me. Uh, and if you have uh, friends or you think you're suitable for the course, please apply. That's it, thank you. The next lecture is Anthony from Technica. Hello, can you hear me? No, closer. Okay, he's gonna fix it uh, on his side. Cable. We should be good. Yes, no, yes. You see it? Ah, great. All right. It's uh, off to a good start. So, let's take this, and you're gonna need this on your side. Yes, we are all good. So, um, hello everyone. Um, so my topic for today is going to be a bit different from the previous one, as it won't be as much Python oriented. Um, first, I would like to ask a question. How many of you have used or dealt with Terraform uh, or Ansible? Okay. So uh, this talk might be a bit familiar to you. And how many of you have dealt with AWS or Azure or GCP? Okay, great. Um, so let's start. So who am I? Um, I'm Anthony Tesser. I'm working in Technofy as a head of uh, engineering. So Technofy is an AWS advanced consulting partner uh, specialized in cloud and creative uh, solutions. And my role there is to make sure that we deliver to our customers with the best technical practices by advising and helping my colleagues whenever I can. Um, I'm from France, but I live here. Uh, my interests are in uh, automation, embedded systems, and electronics. Um, so yeah, what's on today's menu? So we'll start with a little introduction to connectivity in the cloud. We will go over a little overview of infrastructure as a code and configuration management. And at last, we will see the Python for automation. So let's start with the network connectivity in the cloud. Why would you need connectivity inside or to the cloud? Well, 
The whole thing is that you might be moving away from uh, the data center. A lot of uh, big enterprise or even small businesses actually have on-premises data centers. And you might be moving away from that because you realize that um, it costs you a lot of money, you don't have the people to operate it, and thousands of other reasons that uh, you can find pretty much any uh, sales uh, brochures on uh, the cloud vendors. Uh, you might be interested by using one of the managed services proposed by the famous cloud vendors. For example, if you're mainly a Microsoft shop, uh, you might want to use Azure uh, Active Directory in the cloud, or if you are planning to use uh, Kubernetes, you might be tempted to use the GCP uh, Kubernetes engine. Or you might have uh, some kind of a lean approach where you might want to try to give some power to your development teams and let them create stuff in the cloud so that they can pr prototype fast and not wait uh, to get some new hardware or to provision some new virtual, uh, virtual machines by your IT department. Um, in that case, we'll take one use case that we had at Technofy uh, with one of our customer. And this customer has a heavy historical usage of Cisco devices. So we're talking about uh, uh, switches, thousands of switches on premises, thousands of routers on premises, access points, security devices, everything. They have their, they have their the Cisco branded shirts. Um, we're gonna use Palo Alto for cross environment and uh, traffic filtering. So since we're going to do it in the cloud, we're gonna use the virtual appliances for Palo Alto. And one big important piece of the design is evolutivity. As we'll design one thing, but later on they might want to add the different devices, they might want to put some tough in for uh, security probes, they might want to add like uh, one optimizers for the traffic, anything. So we want to keep this in mind. Um, so this use case is used on uh, AWS where uh, they will basically in the connectivity between their on-premises LAN corporate environment to the cloud. And you also need to have connectivity between their different AWS accounts. Because their whole point is basically to have a lot of teams, talking about hundreds of teams that are basically uh, prototyping stuff in the cloud, prototyping, prototyping stuff on-premises, and have connectivity between all of this. Um, but as they're quite uh, involved with uh, military and govern government agencies, they have heavy security requirements. So all this traffic, we're talking about terabytes per day, needs to be correctly uh, encrypted. Uh, the data in the accounts need to be transiting on secure connections and uh, all, the, all the stuff. And for those who know AWS, you might think that Transit Gateway could actually uh, fit the use case here, but actually it's not really the case. Like, it didn't exist back when we designed this solution, and, uh, it, but it still doesn't have all the security features that you might want uh, to have here. So let's do it in simpler terms. First, we have our uh, customer uh, corporate environment, and uh, then we want to have uh, virtual routers in the cloud. We want to have Palo Alto firewalls that will be securing the communications uh, coming from the corporate environment and the cloud. And we're gonna have environments located on the AWS cloud as well. And the whole point is that the traffic goes around uh, between the routers, the firewalls, to make sure that everything is following the security procedures. And this, what you see here, uh, the routers and the firewall is basically what we call the transit VPC as it is the core hub where everything will go through. And as you can see, uh, there, are more, there could be more than two or three uh, instances of each appliance as you want to design your solution to make sure that it is redundant, that nothing breaks, as uh, they might also want to have it in different regions, so multiply it like this again by two. Uh, so yeah, we might have any number of appliances. So uh, why we want to do this? Well, let's take a simple example. Uh, let's say that team A has a dev and testing environment uh, on the cloud. And they want to interact with the microservice that was made by team B, which is in their production environment. Let's say that uh, this uh, microservice allows them to check what is the status of devices on the LAN. Well, in that case, uh, the team B might only, only allow team A to access by HTTPS and MySQL. 
Then you would tell me, yes, but I can do this with the security groups on AWS already. And I would tell you, yes, uh, but this is a very simple use case. And we will see later that uh, we might need a bit more power. Team C uh, is a dev environment and they want to access Team B's prod, but Team, B's, team B doesn't like Team C, so they don't want to allow their traffic. Then we have Team B with, that needs to go to the corporate environment. And for this, they actually need to basically send ICMP messages to basically ping the devices on the LAN. And that's why the security uh, rules say, okay, fine, I will let you go on the corporate, but we will only allow ICMP. And then you have team A that has, let's say, virtual machines on the cloud that uh, people can use like, to have virtual, um, uh, virtual machine, but more like a virtual desktop. That's the word I'm looking for. And they want to allow uh, the virtual desktop to have access to the internet. Only then uh, they will say, yes, but I don't want to have my users going on gambling websites and don't want them to look at porn and stuff like this. So uh, we'll do some URL for filtering. And this is something you can do with the Palo Alto Faro and that you cannot do with uh, AWS security groups. Um, so now that we have seen our requirements, let's see uh, the infrastructure as a code part and the configuration management. So this is the list of all the things that we need to create to have a basic working skeleton of transit VPC. We need a VPC, we need subnets, routing table. Uh, we'll need different gateways to access different parts of the, of the network. So we'll need um, internet gateway to provide internet connectivity. We'll need VPN gateway to allow connection between the LAN environment and the um, cloud environment. And we also need to, these VPN gateways to, co to connect the different environments to the transit VPC inside the cloud. And we will need some S3 endpoint to be able to reach S3, as you can see here, um, the Palo Alto firewalls, when you want to boot them on the cloud, they'll go and pick their configuration uh, from an S3 bucket. And you can see that we need in network interfaces for dedicated interconnectivity between the routers and the firewalls. We will need, uh, uh, of course, compute instances for the routers and the firewalls. That's a lot of uh, things that we need. And now the thing is that this, the guys are going to say, yes, I would like to have one transit VPC. You say, fine, we can do it. Then they're going to say, okay, but I would like to have a dev environment. I would like to have a beta environment uh, or a staging, and I would like to have it as a prod. Oh, and next month I want to deploy it in two other regions. So can we have like nine, nine environments out of that? And you will say, yes, but no. And then this is when you start thinking about automation. So first tool that we're going to use for that is Terraform. Terraform is a tool that allows you to create resources on multiple providers, so AWS, Azure, Kubernetes, um, OpenStack, and uh, they allow you to provision uh, virtual machines, security groups, the whole thing that you need for creating your application, or at least the infrastructure of your application. Uh, it supports plan before apply, which is a very good thing because you might be creating your stack, you write your stack to do your application, but then you're like, okay, I would like to try it, but I don't want to spend my, uh, you know, very hardly earned uh, uh, dollars. So I would like to basically see what I'm going to do before I actually spend the money so that you can do a plan for that. And that's very useful. You have resources lifecycle management. So let's say you create resources uh, in your stack and then you decide, okay, I would like to keep just this little piece here, but not tear down the whole thing because like uh, this is used by other people and I don't want to break their stuff. You can do this as well. And the other thing is that, uh, well, sorry, we are in the Python talk, but uh, Terraform is made in Go. Uh, and uh, Go is quite easily um, approachable, meaning that you can easily hack it a bit if you want to um, modify or add new features that are not yet supported by uh, the community. And all of this is open source, of course. Uh, so yeah, the workflow is that you write your stack. So here is an example of writing resources. Then you do a Terraform init to tell the tool, okay, we're gonna have a stack right here. And then we start doing the plan, so you check what's gonna give. Then you make an apply when you are happy with your changes. And then you just keep iterating all over this because it's all about continuous integration and improvement, isn't it? Second tool is Ansible. So um, Ansible is a tool that you're gonna use to provision your targets. So by targets, I mean like uh, Linux server servers, even Windows servers. Uh, you can even configure Cisco, 
I mean, a lot of appliances. And um, the whole thing is that it uses YAML for configuration. So you don't write commands. You don't write apt get install uh, my package. Instead, you're going to use Ansible to say, uh, fair enough, I would like to just have, make sure that this package is installed. I don't care how you do it. I don't care if you're using yum, uh, aptitude, or something else. Just install my stuff. Again, suppose a dry run so you can check what you're going to do before actually doing it. And it has idempotency, potency, which is very useful as, for example, you might be sending one configuration to say, I would like to, co to have a VPN connection between this IP address and this IP address with this pre-shared key. And you might want to run your script multiple times, <clears throat> but you don't want to create five connections, VPN connections. You just want one. You just want that when you make modifications to your stack, you can actually um, have the changes applying without repeating what was already there. So this is all about item potency. And the next advantage is that do you have 100 devices, 1,000 devices? This is not a problem for Ansible. You just let it run, do its job. It's going to connect on each of your resources and apply the configuration. So this is what uh, configuration for Ansible looks like. And uh, well, in that case here, this is about configure, uh, configuring uh, the IPsec profiles on a uh, Cisco router. Uh, so the, the, the workflow is pretty simple. You just launch the Ansible playbook command. It's going to check the current configuration on the target, and then it's going to make a difference of the changes. So it's all about the right tool for the right job. So we say that we're going to use Terraform for creating the infrastructure resources. We're going to be using it to launch the EC2 instances for our firewall and our router. We're going to be using Ansible for the configuration on the Cisco CSR. And we're going to use Python to wrap all that to make all of this uh, a bit more simple. So one last tool that I did not talk about because it's something that we had to create ourselves um, is that Palo Alto back then, I'm talking about one year and a half, two years ago, didn't have a lot of ecosystem around it. Like you could ha there was a library, a Python library, Pan device. But honestly, it was pretty poor. Like, it was fine if you wanted to configure uh, just a few IP addresses on the, on the firewall and say, I would like to have connected with my home and my uh, office, but uh, not really what you would want in a true corporate enterprise grade network. Uh, we, by digging a bit, we find out that Palo Alto actually uses XML for the device's configuration. So uh, XML, every developer has dealt with XML, not that I wish that you do because it's not the best thing in the world, but uh, fair enough. We're developers, we know how to tackle this. So let's do it with Python. So <clears throat> basically what we did is that we used Jinja 2 <clears throat> to templatize uh, the XML configuration by abstracting a lot of useless crap. Uh, all these, um, you know, the, all, in all configurations, you always have stuff that you don't really care about. It's just there, it's static, it doesn't move. It's needed for the device to work. Uh, it's not documented, uh, but it just has to be there. So what we did is that we basically built a YAML configuration file, which is much more human readable uh, for a network engineer or a security engineer to configure some settings in it. And we use it to feed the data into the XML configuration. Um, so the hardest part of that was that basically <clears throat> we needed to map correctly what was in the YAML sections, uh, where does it go in the XML configuration, and the X path to tell the device where uh, am I should, I should I put this block of configuration in your device configuration. So um, when we had this mapping done correctly, we actually got all we need to basically send the configuration automatically to the device. So pretty classic in uh, our uh, decade. Um, the device uses an API, which is accessible through uh, HTTP. Um, in our case, a classic POST with the body. Uh, it's not a JSON body or anything. It just uses a good old uh, URL uh, encoding uh, with the ampersand and all that shit. Um, so basically, on the key uh, is the API token that you get for the device to be able to, say, to send authenticated uh, requests. The type, we want to modify the configuration. And the action is that we want to set a configuration block inside the device. 
Again, the XPath uh, comes into play where we're gonna tell to the device, we're gonna send your configuration there, and the element is the actual uh, configuration. Um, but the thing is that there are some dependencies in uh, all that. So for example, you might configure a BGP, you want to configure BGP routing on your, um, on your uh, firewall, fine. Uh, the thing is that we might identify which piece of the configuration is responsible for BGP, fair enough. Uh, but then you learn that BGP actually needs a, re a redistribution profile. Fair, okay, that's one dependency we can manage it. Then you realize that your redistribution profile actually needs to have access to uh, some uh, elements like uh, uh, to which peers I need to uh, redistribute. And then you have another dependency that you have to manage. So uh, do you spend a lot of time trying to go around all these dependencies to find the right order to send everything correctly? So the takeaway on that is was that um, the configuration generator, it fulfills a very particular task, but it does it perfectly because basically since we're writing a custom tool, we get the full uh, feature um, coverage. Uh, it demystifies a lot for me and the security engineers how the Palo Alto firewall works uh, under the hood, like how things are done and how things are applied. And of course, since we write it ourselves, it was very easy to integrate it with the rest of our tooling. What was less good is that uh, it was, honestly, it was hell to debug that uh, because the thing is that you templatize a configuration, fair enough. Uh, what if you made a mistake in your template? Or actually, what if you made a mistake in your API call? How do you debug that? The firewall is not gonna tell you, hey, by the way, you've, uh, you messed up your HTTP request, something, you shouldn't say, I don't like your configuration at all. So you have to go through all the things that you send, you know, verbose mode classic, you open the notepad and you check line by line what's going on. And at one point, if you get this uh, spark of genius, you might find it, otherwise you're stuck for another hour. Um, there is very poor documentation. Actually, I would say there is no documentation at all on uh, using their API. Most of this was reverse engineering ourselves what was in the configuration, so we dumped the whole configuration of the device so that we can find which pieces we needed because nothing of that is documented. And as I said, slicing the configuration to have everything in the right order was uh, very tough as well. But anyway, we have this done. So now let's automate things with Python as we have all the tools to have our transit VPC created. So we have one big Terraform stack with a lot of parameters. I'm talking about uh, subnet uh, CIDR, so the IP ranges uh, we have to take care of uh, the SSH keys that we are going to in inject in the devices. All of that stuff is gonna be needed to create a Terraform stack. And we're talking about, I would say, around uh, 200 parameters. Um, we have an Ansible playbook with a lot of parameters as we are going to use it to configure the Cisco routers. So here, again, uh, talking about the BGP configuration, network configuration, security configuration, all that jazz. And uh, Palo Alto configuration generator, that we have just uh, seen before. And this one needs a huge amount of uh, parameters. And when you take all that into account, this is just too much for a single person to have everything, everything completely right on the first try. You're gonna bump your head against the wall. So let's tackle this problem. Like a lot of these parameters are actually repeated between the three deployment mechanisms. So for example, the IP ranges, they're gonna be used both in the Terraform and the Ansible stack. It's actually gonna be also used inside the Palo Alto generator, as all of these devices live in the same network. Some of these parameters can be computed from the others. So I'm, let's say you have an IP range, like you're configuring uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, point -point VPN connection. So of course you're gonna have a network range, so it's gonna be a slash 31 or slash 30 depending on your device. In our case we had the slash 30. Um, when you have the address of the network slash 30, well, this is the address of the network and the address of the first host is this address plus one. And if you want the next host in the, in the range, same address plus two. Uh, so this is easily computable and you don't need to have a human writing these things uh, by hand and wasting uh, precious uh, time for that. So this we can compute it ourselves. And for the rest of the parameters that are all about uh, what's the naming of the device, which uh, in, what is the globality of the, where it should live on the network, this is up to the user slash network engineer. Um, so how we tackle that again with the YAML file as an input, where we're gonna have the transit VPC config generator, 
which is going to itself generate configuration files for Terraform, for the Palo Alto, and for the Ansible. Um, so in the end result, uh, this is one part, like this is about, a file like this is about 100 lines usually, but it describes the whole stack of how to create a transit VPC uh, from scratch. So as you can see, we have terms that actually talk to network engineers, like what should be the ASN of my BGP, uh, or which NTP servers I want to use on my devices. And all this generic information is then transformed into all the configuration files that we need to inject on, with Ansible and Terraform. So yeah, from 100 lines uh, of configuration here, we actually output more than 2,000 lines of configuration that don't need to be done by a human. And thanks to that, we have a much more human-friendly process where human error is a very, slow mar a very low margin. The takeaway of that is that uh, it greatly reduces the complexity of the management of the, the, of the solution. So tomorrow your boss says, I want to have TransVPC in three other regions. Fine, you just create, you just take the same configuration file that you had, we just saw just before, change a few values, and just run the tool and it's gonna do everything for you. Um, it's very easy to experiment new settings. So for example, you have uh, timeout settings for uh, the hanging TCP connections. Well, you want to try something better, like something smaller, something uh, higher, fair enough, just change it and uh, just relaunch the configuration, it's gonna do everything for you. So basically we went from deploying a full transit VPC by hand, that was taking one, two days, as it was a lot of uh, configuration, trial and error, because you always forget something, you might forget to tag a resource correctly, or then you might make a mistake in the uh, configuration, the initial configuration to send to the Palo Alto. So yeah, we switched that from 48 hours to 30 minutes. What was less good in that? Well, actually, it's just that um, the stack changes, so if you change your Terraform stack or your Ansible stack, then you need to reflect that in your generator. Um, this is not really a problem. It is a problem when you have a team that is not developers. So when you have network engineers, they might not have this hygiene of keeping you know, your dependencies uh, um, uh, maintained. So that's why, like, if you give them this uh, DevOps uh, mentality and development mentality of uh, keep your stuff clean, then everything is fine. But yeah, that's one of the problems that we made back then. So there you have it. Uh, that's the, how we created the Trans VPC uh, from uh, pretty much uh, bits of uh, wood and scrap and how we automated it. Thank you. Does anyone have questions? Yes. There you go. Thanks. So um, I wanted to ask you, when it comes to Terraform, uh, how do you structure your project? Because uh, HashiCorp do not have a dedicated way to structure your Terraform code. You can write all the Terraform in, in, in one file, you can write a thousand files and it can work again. So my question is how you split your Terraform project? Well, I can tell you what we did in this uh, project in particular. One thing to, not, to note first is that uh, the Terraform 0.12 version was not released back then. For those who don't know Terraform, uh, ver the release 0.12 added a lot of uh, new things to uh, their language, uh, the, the, the DSL that they use for describing the resources, and makes a lot of things uh, much easier. Back then, what we did is that basically, uh, I had uh, for each step, so I had first step was create a VPC. For this create VPC thing, it was a different stack. So inside there was a main file for uh, creating the resources, but since it was like 10, 12 resources, it would fit in one file and it was easy to read. Then I had another file for the variables, another file for the outputs. And then the whole thing was that I had a daisy chain of all my different stacks. So the next one was provision the CSRs. So I would create the routers uh, on uh, the second stage. It would take uh, as input the outputs from the first stage. And again, I had like one file routers because the description of the, instant, the EC2 instances was quite big. And uh, I wanted to be able to tweak it easily or if uh, someone else needed to add some parameters, they could do it easily and not have to locate in the code where it is. It was quite explicit. Um, and again, same mechanism, variables, outputs, uh, and all this all the way down. So in total, uh, in terms of steps, uh, it was, uh, as I said, create VPC, 
um, provision the CSRs. The first step for the Palo Alto, so to create the uh, S3 bucket in which we put the configuration. And the first, second step for the Palo Alto, where we actually create the instances once this bucket has the configuration. So this is how we structured it. We could have probably done it with modules. Uh, the thing is that Terraform modules back then, they did not support you putting a count. So like um, in Terraform, when you have, let's say, uh, EC2 instance resource, you might say, I want to spawn 10 of these uh, instances, and you just put count 10, easy as that. The thing is that modules, there you could think about it as like exactly like modules in, uh, in Python, actually, uh, except that you create resources with these modules. But you could not say, I want to have 10 times this module. Uh, so that was quite of a, a pain. They added this in 0 0.12. So um, yes, that's, uh, that's about how we architecture the thing. Do you have a specific architecture in mind or a specific application that you're asking for? No, this answers the question. Thanks. Okay. Any other question? Nope. Well, good. Okay, great. Well, in that case, have a good evening.
I think it works. Yeah, but you're not gonna yep. take Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's working. I don't know if... Should I move it closer? Can I? Yep. Just... Yeah, now? Thanks. Okay, guys, um, can we start? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> we are going to have time for networking after the last talk. So let's see what uh, Venceslav has to say now. Thank you. Yep. Do you hear me well, guys? Is it okay, the sound? Thanks. Yep. So I suppose we can start? Okay. Yeah. So hello everyone. Uh, as Teddy said, I'm Ventislav and I am a software developer at Hacksoft. And today I'm going to show you how to build GraphQL queries using Python. So let's begin with our problem. What is our problem actually? Well, this is one of our problems. But it's not the real one. Actually, the problem is we have GraphQL. And we have some different notations. Uh, we have just a new specification how to build a query. And let's see in more detail. Um, the query that we want to uh, build in the end is this one. Uh, and every GraphQL query starts with the query keyword. Then we have the name of our query, which is bookings. This is taken from a real project at Hacksoft, when we deal, where we deal with some bookings. Um, then in, uh, in the brackets, uh, we have some filters. For example, the first one is customer ID. So uh, we just want to be able to filter some bookings by a customer ID, so we, want to, so we can get the bookings of a specific customer. And then we have another by clause, which is just ordering our uh, results in by some constraints. Then we have the edges and nodes, which are some GraphQL relay uh, specifications, which I'll explain in a short. But uh, simply each node is a single entry of our query. For example, the node is a single booking. And we, uh, in this query, we want to fetch its start date, its end date, and something called building ref, which is uh, shortened for building reference, which is just a shortened string representation of the building this booking is for. Then we have cursor, which is something really specific for uh, the pagination in GraphQL, which I'll also explain in the relay section. And then we have page info, which is just a short information of our pagination. So do we have a next page uh, and the cursors, which uh, I'll also explain in a second. But we want to build all of this with Python. So we can think of a solution. Uh, one solution that uh, we found in 
in Hacksoft and uh, that we use is called Simple GraphQL Client. It's sh uh, shortened for SGQLC. Uh, it's hosted on GitHub, uh, developed by Profusion. Uh, and why we chose it? Uh, it's basically the most sophisticated one of the all packages that we tried. And it has the most stars on GitHub, so it's another important thing. So let's begin with an overview of this package. We have several modules that we use. Um, the first one is a types module, uh, where they're just the primitive data types that we have in Python, but are represented in the context of this library. So we have integers, strings, booleans, lists, and everything. The second one is a submodule of types. It's called date time. It's again the same thing, but here we uh, the types when we deal with uh, dates, times, timestamps, and everything related to dates. Um, we have types, uh, which uh, well we have relay types, sorry, uh, which are related to relay. We have the nodes and connection, and basically you've seen the node how it looks like. The connection class is basically the link between the edge and the node, uh, but I'll show you uh, later on. And another thing is operation. This is the main entry point of our construction process. Uh, it's called, as you've seen, it's called query here, and it's called query here again. Um, and it's the main entry point of the program, and then we have endpoints.http, which is wrapping the whole GraphQL uh, body of the request is wrapping it in a request which we can send to a server. So, uh, for example, uh, of our query, the, the building reference here is something that we can represent from the types module. So, as I said, building reference is a string. So, ev every primitive data type is stored in types. So, we can represent building reference with string type. We have date time module uh, from which we can represent the start and end dates of the node. We have relay, uh, and basically relay types are all related to pagination, ordering, and filtering of our results. Uh, and for example, this page info comes out of the, out of the box when you use uh, certain classes from the library. Uh, and edges and nodes are just the specification of relay and how you should build uh, your queries in order to have out of the box pagination, ordering, and filtering. So, about relay, uh, it's basically you have a query, which is, for example, in our case, it's bookings, where we link every single entry of, of this query set with an edge. It's basically the same as the graph theory, but it's represented in, in this uh, case. So you have edges, which are linked with certain nodes, and each node has a cursor. So basically a cursor is a unique ID, which is only related to pagination. So for example, if you want to have, uh, if you want to, for example, if you want to uh, page from a certain cursor to the end, you can say next cursor, and you can use the ID from a specific from a specific booking. Um, it's basically how uh, the relay specification looks like. So we can continue with the rest of the query. We have operation, uh, which is, as I said, the main entry point of the query building process, which is our query. And we have the HTTP module, which is wrapping the whole uh, GraphQL request in uh, GraphQL body, sorry, in an HTTP POST request because everything uh, in GraphQL is based on a single endpoint which receives POST requests. So let's start with defining how our node looks like. So. Uh, we can import uh, all the needed uh, types, so we need node, which is coming from relay, as I said. And what node gives us here is basically uh, we have the cursor coming out of the box. We have IDs, which are coming also out of the box. Um, we have string types, as I said, building reference is a string type. 
and we have date times, which is coming from the date time module. So this basically is dealing with this part of our query. It's start, end date, and building reference, and cursor, as I said, comes from the node class. And yes, it appends the cursor to the uh, request by default, so you can uh, extract it if you don't want it, but it attaches. So we can continue with our edge. Um, the types module actually contain two other classes which are called type and field, which are some generic representations of, for example, edge is just a simple type. We don't have a dedicated class for edge, and we just use type in this case. And if you want to reference another type, because node is also a type, if you want to reference another type uh, in a certain uh, other type, we just we use fields and we provide this type to the property. So we attach each edge with a node field and we attach our booking node. So we can continue with the connection. What the connection is about is that we say, okay, we have nodes which uh, are related to the query with some edges, which are these red lines that I showed you, and we have the connection between all of it, and we say, okay, edges are list of booking edges. So list of, again, is the list representation of the list data structure representation. It also come fr comes from types, but I haven't imported because I didn't have enough space. But it comes from the types also. It's basically the representation of the list. And the connection here gives us the page information. So we have, um, Start and cursor has next page, which is a boolean, and we have some other things that uh, are related to pagination. But for example, when you have uh, a cursor for each node in the edges, you can see, in the page info you can see which is the okay, which is the start cursor. So basically, you receive the the first cursor of the first node in the result, and the end cursor is the last one. So and has next pages. Basically, you can check whether you have next pages to to, to to iterate. And the final thing is mm, that we need to define our query. So we say, uh, okay, we need a query class. Uh, another thing important here is that this library wants you to name your query exactly query. I mean, you cannot name it booking query, for example. They search for this specific class. I don't know why they build it like that. It's strange, but you should call it query. It's also a type. And we just connect our bookings, uh, and it's a field which is a booking connection. So basically everything uh, fr from the bottom to the top is just related, uh, they're just related to, to, to each other. Then the arguments that I showed you uh, in the beginning, the customer ID and the, all the by clause, they're just accepted uh, by the args keyword argument on the field. Uh, on the connection, and we just say, okay, what is the name of, our, of my parameter, and what is the type of it? So these two strings are represented in the arcs. So our schema of how, our of how we want our query to look like is basically done. We just constructed all of our needed um, infrastructure to connect the nodes, the edges, the page information, the filtering, the, and the order by, and the whole query is done. But at the end, we want to actually build the query. We have constructed the classes, the inheritance, but we just, we need to build our query. And how this is done is, at first, we need to initialize our query. How to initialize, basically you wrap it in an operation class, which comes from operation. Uh, as I said, this is the main entry point of the program. So you attach your bookings query to an operation, uh, which begins to construct it. Then, uh, uh, a little note here, everything in this library, more specific, is based on the code under method. So if you want to attach something or invoke something, I mean, uh, for example, if you want to attach 
all edges to the bookings query where it provided the customer ID and the uh, order by uh, close. If you call edges, which is the property uh, from here, if you call edges, it goes to the ancestor chain and attaches all edges that you've defined. So there's no need to go through each edge and call, yeah, attach me at the start date, attach the end date, and attach the building reference. If you call edges, it's attached to all edges. But if you want to attach specific edges, you can just go to each property in the, in the chain and call the specific property that you want to attach to the query. And for example, if you go through the last line, it will attach only the start date of, uh, of the whole query and it won't attach the end date and the building reference. So as you've built the query, you need to uh, call a certain GraphQL endpoint to provide this query too. And this is done via the HTTP endpoint class, which is uh, just accepting uh, a URL. So here you place your GraphQL endpoint URL. And the result of the, of the actual call is based, as I said, to the call method of the endpoint. So you, at first you initialize your endpoint and then you invoke its call method with the query that you've built before. So you've built your, uh, your, your filter arguments, you attach the edges, so the properties that you want to receive, and then you wrap it in uh, HTTP endpoints to send it through the network and receive a GraphQL result. So let's see what we have achieved by the end of this, of this line. So we actually got our initial uh, query, but we got it with Python. So we have the query, we have, uh, which is named bookings. We can provide some filters for, in this example is customer ID. Um, we have the order by clause. Uh, we have edges and nodes, which are the relay specification in order to have out of the box pagination. We attach the certain fields that we want to have. We have the cursor and the page info coming out of the box. So furthermore, we have some other things that we can, we can do and they're actually working here. We have first, which is there, all, all these fields are in the bookings uh, brackets. So we can say, okay, return, uh, give me the first three bookings. Give me the first 10 bookings. So you can use this filtration. You can use limit, so you can say, okay, return only five bookings, or only 10 bookings, or whatever. And we have the after close, which is uh, the one that we discussed with the cursor. So we have uh, a each unique cursor ID for each node. So you can say, okay, give me the bookings starting from, starting after this specific cursor. So you have this variance of filtration, and have some other, which uh, uh, described in the GraphQL specification and the relay documentation, uh, which I've left, uh, so uh, you can guys dig for the more. And that's basically how we can build uh, GraphQL queries using Python. And thank you for your attention, and I'm waiting for your questions. Questions from someone? Nope. Yep. I need to turn it on the slide. Yep. Check. Prova. Check. Yes. Any questions? I have a question. Yep. Can, can you return the slide where you combined everything and made the HTTP call? So here, what's what's the type of result? Is it uh, uh, instances of the types you defined previously or plain dictionaries? Result is actually a string which is containing this. But 
as it is at in, in the HTTP endpoint instance, uh, if after you call it, the query is taken from the operation. But if you, I mean, it has a it has a string dunder, and if you print the result, it comes as a string instance. But actually, is just an operation. Well, if you open the um, implementation of operation, it's just uh, building uh, the whole the whole query, but uh, the 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 result that you get, you, you, you asked for this, yeah. Yeah, so the result is the constructed GraphQL query that you can, after this, pass to some API endpoint. Yeah, but when it is attached to the request, there is a, I don't know if some uh, specific uh, notations, you have, for example, you have JSON body, but you have another thing which is GraphQL body, which is encoding in uh, some different way. But here, if you want to play with the result furthermore, this is actually a string. And it's formatted exactly in this way. It looks like this. It's exactly the same. But why do you need the HTTP endpoint then? It's not making a call, right? It's not making an HTTP call to GraphQL API or I'm missing. Well, here it is making a call. But but, well. The result is the, the, the string, result. but it, the string representation of the result is the string of the GraphQL, but it has methods to extract the result of the API call. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Other question? Yep. So does the cursor represent kind of a unique ID for each node or yes. it's, okay, so it doesn't change every, every time you make a call? No. I mean, do you generate the cursor at the time of the call or yes? Well, the, the cursor is generated at the time of the call, but every other time you call the, end, the, the endpoint with this body, the cursor is the same, but it's unique for, for every single node. Okay. And it's unique only in terms of pagination. You don't you don't uh, have any other use cases. You just can use it with these clauses here, for example, with after okay. the cursor. But it's basically only related to the page information here, and it's a, just a string, uh, a random generated uh, ID, uh, and you use it only for this. Okay. Other questions? Hi, Vince. Hi, Mark. Um, I want to ask something more about the uh, implementation. So I guess the, can you uh, turn back the code from the last slide? Yeah, this one. Okay. Until when this thing is lazy? I mean, is bookings uh, dot edges dot nodes uh, something like a generator? Oh, it's in your RAM? It's just a class or? I wish it could, but it isn't. Oh. Actually, on the, on line 11. Yeah. The, the query is actually constructed, but it's not, uh, it's not wrapped in the request. Mm -hmm. But here, uh, you have the all edges attached and you have the, the query already constructed. And it's not, it's not evaluated here if you, if you have this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not. Okay, that was my question. Other questions? Thank you everybody for coming. Thanks. There is still uh, beer left and water and snacks, so just feel free to do it, drink and talk with us <laughs> and see you next time of course <laughs>